In this lecture, we're going to look at signal routing and naming, as well as adding test points and logging signals. First off, let's discuss signal routing. I'll go ahead and create a new Simulink model to illustrate my key points. I'll open the library browser also. A key consideration when routing signals is model readability. That means, among other things, that you want to make sure that signal lines do not run on top of each other. I'll put two input ports into my model, as well as two output ports. Now I'll connect each input to the output diagonally opposite it. If I try to run the signal lines on top of each other, I'm prevented from doing so. Simulink routes the lines in parallel above or below each other. Unfortunately, older versions of Simulink won't necessarily do this for you. So if you're using an older version of Simulink, you may need to take care when manually routing signal lines to ensure that one signal line does not end up on top of another, or your logic will become difficult to read as the signal paths will be hard to follow. It is okay, however, for signal lines to cross each other at 90 degree angles. It's much easier to follow the signal flow in your model when it is consistent. A good convention to follow is that signals should work their way from left to right and from top to bottom within your model. In other words, keep your inputs on the left-hand side of the model, your outputs on the right-hand side, and, when performing intermediate calculations, avoid having your signal lines move toward the top of the model. Direct signal paths down and to the right instead. There are some specific cases where this won't work, such as with the feedback path in a closed-loop control system, but, in general, this is a good convention to follow. Accordingly, with signals starting on the left and ending on the right, it makes sense that you would expect to see input ports in your subsystem on the left-hand side of the subsystem and output ports on the right-hand side of the subsystem. If inputs and outputs are just strewn haphazardly throughout your logic, it can be much harder to read, especially in a large subsystem. We discussed buses and muxing and demuxing signals in a previous lesson, so I won't cover that material again. But using buses or muxing and demuxing signals can also be a great way to clean up your model and make it more readable, especially when you put signals with similar features into a bus together, rather than just making the bus a random collection of signals. Something else worth thinking about is naming signals. It is often helpful to name signals. This can be critical in embedded systems where those names are later used to access memory locations. Even in simple simulations, however, naming signals makes it immediately apparent what each signal is and makes it easier to avoid incorrectly connecting outputs of one subsystem to inputs of another. Avoid using special characters when naming signals, except that it is common to use underscores rather than spaces. If you prefer, you can also use camel case and just capitalize the first letter of each word in your signal signal name and concatenate the words rather than using underscores. To name a signal, select the signal line, right click over the signal line, go to properties, enter a signal name. I'll call this signal signal1 using camel case and click OK. Simulink also allows you to create test points and log signals in the same dialog box that you use for naming signals. I'll open that dialog box again. Logging signals allows you to access those signals after simulation through the logs out object. This tool can allow you to do things like write an mfile script to generate a number of custom plots after running a simulation so that you have a nice way of presenting your simulation results. Test points can be important for real-time workshop when compiling code for embedded systems to ensure that you can access your name signals later when running your compiled model on a physical system. I'll specify that this signal should be a logged test point. When I click OK, you'll notice the icon on the signal line, which indicates that this signal is a logged test point. One thing to keep in mind with this, having a large number of logged signals in a model will slow down your simulations, so try to limit the number of test points that you log to a reasonable number. I'm going to delete the unused signal line. I'll also pull in a sine wave block and replace my input block with it. After deleting one of the name signal's anchoring blocks, I'll have to re-specify that I want it to be a logged test point. Now I'll run my simulation. You'll notice that a logs out object appears in my base workspace. I can plot my signal from the logs out object in the base workspace. I'll go ahead and do so now, entering my command in the command window. So even though I didn't have a scope in my model, by logging the signal I was still able to plot my simulation results. 
Thanks for joining me for this lesson. I hope this lesson has been instructive for you. Next time, we'll look at troubleshooting errors and diagnostic messages so that you will have a better understanding of what to do when things don't go as planned.